October in the Ban Valley in the north of Ireland in 1718. And as the tree-lined rivers and estuaries started to adopt an autumnal hue, many of the Presbyterian congregations in County Londonderry decided to leave behind persecution and bad harvests and sail these waters towards a new life 3,000 miles away. This was a journey that could take between three and six months as their sailing ships creaked and groaned, lambasted by heavy seas, cruel winds and biting cold, a physical and mental challenge that was almost unimaginable in its ferocity. Led by the Reverend James McGregor of Ahadui, the occupants of the ships were farmers, carpenters, weavers, and many of them former soldiers. These fighters had been at the Siege of Derry in 1689, and McGregor, aged only 12 years old, was said to have fired the cannon that signified the blockade erected by the forces loyal to the Catholic King James had been broken, and the starvation of the city ended. But it's the story of Peter Cochrane, another veteran of the siege, also from Ahadoui, that's even more captivating. Aged 92, he accompanied McGregor on that voyage and lived to tell the tale here, in what was named Derry, New Hampshire. Just imagine the grit and determination, the perseverance of an early setter like Peter Cochrane, who embarked on his overseas journey at the age of 92 and lived for additional four years here in the New World, clearing uh, a home in the forest and uh, surviving uh, the attacks of the, the Yabanaki tribe, a fierce group of Indians who lived in Maine. It's, it's absolutely remarkable and it's inspiring and it's hoped that people today so preoccupied with their own troubles, if they would only look back into their own history and see that what they're contending with today pales into comparison uh, with the trials and tribulations of the first settlers. So establishing settlements such as Derry and Londonderry, New Hampshire and Belfast, Maine didn't come without fierce resistance. The immigrant ships were originally destined for Connecticut, but they needed to stop in Boston after a harrowing journey. Here, they encountered sticks and stones from locals who labelled them as Irish. But after meeting land agent Robert Temple, they were convinced to sail north to Maine and settle his lands along the Kennebec River. It was here at Merry Meeting Bay that the McFadden family from Garva, County Londonderry, established their new homestead in dense woodland. They named it Somerset, after their home in Northern Ireland of the same name, on the banks of the River Ban. Today in Maine, this is the site of an archaeological dig by the McFadden descendants to uncover artefacts from the time. A tobacco pipe, probably belonging to the settler Andrew McFadden, was found almost intact and may tell the tale of a rapid escape from Indian attack. It really kind of stopped me in my tracks because for that moment, I envisioned my seventh great-grandfather 300 years ago setting it down, possibly in haste, knowing that the Indians were coming down the river. But then for me, 300 years later, to dig it up and be the first person to pick it up after he had set it down. And that not only was emotional for me, I think everyone on our crew, it just kind of stopped everybody when they made, you know, when they put that thought in their own heads. It's like, yeah, how bizarre to have the same family pick it up 300 years later. The immigrants brought specific skills with them that led to the industrial development of these lands in a mirror image of what happened back in Northern Ireland. Woodworking expertise led to shipbuilding in Belfast, Maine, where hundreds of schooners and sailing ships were constructed in the 19th and 20th centuries. While in Belfast, Northern Ireland, the shipyard had become world famous for constructing vessels such as the Titanic. Londonderry and Derry, New Hampshire developed a national reputation for their linen and shirt manufacture, while Londonderry, Northern Ireland and its hinterlands 
were weaving linen on a massive scale and exporting it to all corners of the world. The weaving of linen, particularly by a woman, was particularly important, both here in Ulster and on the frontier, and we call it the frontier in New England. It was a skill that they were used to practicing. It was a very sophisticated skill. It required precision, it required a fine touch, and that was taken with them to America and practiced there. And initially, of course, this was what we call a cottage industry. So people would have had a loom in one room in their house, and so also in New Hampshire. And the same with spinning. They took the spinning wheels with them. And the spinning wheels here had been very much advanced by the Huguenots who brought new technology with them into Ulster and that was then transferred to New Hampshire with the migrants. The Ulster American Folk Park near Oma County Tyrone is dedicated to celebrating the emigration from the north of Ireland to the United States down the centuries. The post-famine exodus of the Catholic Irish to New York, Boston and the Carolinas in the 1850s is the best known. What is much less publicised is the journey more than 100 years beforehand of the Scots-Irish. Their descendants became some of the best known names in American history, with no fewer than 20 US presidents tracing their ancestry to the north of Ireland. Our story ends here at Forest Hill Cemetery in Derry, New Hampshire where the Reverend James McGregor and his wife Mary Ann are buried, far away from where the story began at Achadui, County Londonderry in Northern Ireland.